Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Multiple Sclerosis Continuing Medical Education Series. My name is Lucas Kipp. I'm a clinical assistant professor and MS specialist here at the Stanford MS Clinic in Palo Alto. In our last lecture, we explored the different phases and phenotypes of MS, the concept of neurologic reserve, and the importance of early treatment. Today, we'll be discussing MS therapies, emphasizing the use of high efficacy therapies in the disease course, as well as concepts in monitoring MS and our goals of treatment. And by the end of this talk, I hope I've convinced you of the advantage of high efficacy therapy in MS treatment, and that with regular monitoring, you can be certain that the medication you've chosen is working and is safe for your patients long-term. Now in the last few lectures, I'm trying to give you the tools to recognize the symptoms of and diagnose MS, and also illustrate the importance of early optimal therapy. Now I want you to try to picture a patient coming into your practice where you suspect or have recently made the diagnosis. What do you do? Not everyone watching this lecture is a neurologist. What can you do? Make a referral to an MS specialist, sure. I mean, in a previous lecture, we learned that patients undergoing MS specialty care do have better outcomes. But is there anything else you can do right now for that patient that is sitting in your office. And in these first few slides, before we talk about long-term disease-modifying treatments, I hope to convince you that you can and that you should. So my first question to you is, would you treat an MS attack with steroids in your practice? And if not, what are your barriers to initiating this treatment? If you're a primary care physician, you are the one that has the earliest opportunity to intervene. And for acute therapy, for someone that's having an active MS exacerbation, giving them steroids is really low risk. So I'd encourage you to be comfortable treating suspected MS relapses with steroids. Now, traditionally, IV steroids have been used at one gram for three to five days. But there are barriers to giving IV steroids. The number one barrier is usually that it requires an infusion site or going to the emergency department. There's high cost associated with that. And that Current evidence shows that there isn't really a difference between the outcomes of people that got IV steroids or oral steroids. And so you can just give the oral equivalent dose of one gram IV, which is about 1200 milligrams of oral prednisone. Now that translates into 25, 50 milligram tablets for three days. So that's a handful of prednisone that your patient would have to take for three days, but it keeps them at a hospital and it makes sure that the treatment that they get is timely. And I imagine that you're most worried about the potential side effects of such a big dose. Well, if you look at the chart here, there's really no difference in the risks of IV versus oral other than the oral therapies might make you a little bit more activated and not be able to sleep at night. But overall, these symptoms, even if they have these side effects, are relatively mild. Insomnia, headache. You know, if people have prior mood disturbance like bipolar disorder, you know, you might make them a little bit more activated. I think one thing that we run into very frequently is what about patients who are diabetic and monitoring their sugars? Well, you can just recommend that your patient checks their sugars more frequently, takes a little bit more insulin if they need it. 
But these are relatively low burden side effects over a very short period of time. That short interval of treatment for three days also doesn't require that you put them on any kind of infectious prophylaxis or stomach protection prophylaxis, nor does it result in any kind of you know, adrenal suppression. So I'd encourage you to get comfortable prescribing oral high-dose prednisone for patients that you suspect are having an MS attack. Now, as we talked about in lectures one and three, there are a number of modifiable risk factors in MS that any healthcare provider can counsel their patients on as well. And so again, I'd encourage you to incorporate these conversations into your regular visits. You can talk about promoting a healthy diet and vitamin D supplementation. You can talk about promoting cardiovascular fitness. You can talk about smoking sensation and how smoking while having MS increases the risk of relapse by up to 25%. And if you're a primary care physician, you're already treating uh, their medical comorbidities, particularly these vascular risk factors. But knowing that these factors are also potentially increasing their disability progression in MS may actually help you counsel the patients and the patients themselves to take more ownership on keeping these other medical comorbidities in check as well. Likewise, there's lots of other ways that you can help your patients with MS beyond the treatments I've already mentioned. One of the best things that you can do is to help connect them with MS organizations for support. For example, the National MS Society. I also encourage you to be comfortable placing patients on short-term disability. You know, the early weeks to months of getting a workup for MS involves lots of blood work, MRIs, lumbar punctures. Not only that, it's emotionally draining for patients. And so putting them on short-term disability is very reasonable. And it's something that any healthcare provider can do. Knowing that this is going to be a challenging time for patients, um, particularly for patients that have comorbid mental health conditions, that's also a good time to address you know, their feelings around the diagnosis and you know, connecting them with the therapist if they need to really early on. You know, some patients uh, who have relatively you know, mild symptoms um, might just need some accommodations at work. Or, you know, they might really want to you know, not, not go to work um, because, you know, they don't want people to know or something like that. So, you know, suggesting adapting their work environment or even their work hours um, in order to maintain employment, I think is something else that can be done. And also very importantly is anticipating the need for allied health services. And so, you know, it's really nice to be able to work at a big academic center where we have all of these services available. But to be honest, most of our patients, you know, don't even live within an hour or two of, of the center. And so, you know, you, if you follow patients with MS, having a, a go-to of, of these types of professionals in your area um, is going to serve the MS patients that you follow so well. And if you're not sure who in your area might see patients with MS, whether it's physical therapists, occupational therapists, um, social workers, psychology, et cetera, the National MS Society's website actually has a great searchable database that's open to patients, all healthcare providers, to help find these allied health resources in their area. And so I encourage you to also point your patients towards that. So we're going to shift gears a little bit now into pharmacologic disease modifying therapy. And there's really been a rapid expansion of available therapy options for MS, which can be really challenging to navigate. And so I wanted to offer some additional concepts to consider when selecting treatment, really building upon those notions that we had already discussed in prior lectures. 
Now you can think about RMS therapies in terms of how they work or their mechanism of action, things like, are they immunomodulatory? Are they anti-cell trafficking? Are they cell depleting? You can refer to the American Academy of Neurology guidelines where they outline 16 different recommendations, three of them which have level A evidence, which I've depicted here. They're very broad, they're common sense. They include things like, you know, setting aside dedicated time or a specific visit just to discuss treatment options, uh, incorporating many factors into the decision, efficacy, side effects, patient preference, setting realistic ex expectations uh, of what our medications can do. You know, they're really meant to stop new injury. They don't fix the damage that's been done or ameliorate the symptoms that are already there. So while important, you know, these guidelines aren't overly helpful in selecting a specific agent for a specific individual. And while more algorithmic approaches have been tried to be applied to selecting MS therapies, the truth is that, you know, every patient with MS is different and treatment decisions really need to be made on an individualized basis but I think I can give you some concepts about how to think about that. I think it's most helpful to think about these treatments in terms of how well they work, as opposed to kind of how they do so. And in general, we think about treatments as low efficacy or lower efficacy. This has generally been the older injectable ther uh, therapies like interferons or glutiramir acetate because they only reduce the annualized relapse rate by about a third. Then you've got kind of your medium efficacy therapies. These are generally your oral therapies, which reduce the relapse rates about 50%. And then you've got your high efficacy therapies, which are generally infusion therapies um, that reduce the relapse rates, you know, 70 or 80 percent, um, particularly when you're doing all those other things like modifying those risk factors that we previously talked about. Now, taking these into consideration, you know, some believe in a purely what's called an escalation approach, meaning you start everybody on the lowest efficacy therapy and you only escalate their treatments to something stronger if there's breakthrough disease. Whereas others take more of an inductionist approach, meaning you start everybody on the highest efficacy therapy, and then you dial back treatment later on. So let's look at the evidence of these you know, two somewhat dissimilar approaches. So in a recent 2019 population-based cohort of patients uh, with MS in Wales, Disability outcomes were compared between the escalation approach, which is the green line here, versus what they're calling the early intensive approach. And what this found was that for those people that were started on the higher efficacy therapy early, fewer of those patients became disabled. And the difference became apparent in just a few years. That's kind of where those lines are diverging. The study also showed that even if disability does increase, the average amount of time or the average amount of disability change was lower in the early intensive or high efficacy treatment group uh, compared to the escalation group. Likewise, in this study, they were comparing this treatment strategy between two countries. And these are two countries that have large national MS databases where they capture you know, almost all the patients in their country that have MS. But these two countries have two different treatment approaches. So Sweden, which is the orange line, has a much larger proportion of patients that are put on a highly effective disease-modifying therapy as a first-line treatment. Versus in Denmark, uh, which, are, which is in green, nearly all the patients start out with a lower or moderately effective disease-modifying therapy and then are escalated. 
So we're really comparing kind of the high efficacy treatments um, that is more common in Sweden uh, to uh, Denmark with the more of the escalation approach. And what you can see from these graphs is really that the Swedish cohort, more of them remain uh, free of disability progression than the Danish group. And they have a longer time before they have a relapse compared to the Danish group. And this difference is almost certainly explained by the fact that about a third of patients in the Swedish group were started on high efficacy therapy in the first place. And high efficacy therapy in this cohort was considered to be rituximab, which in the US is considered an off-label MS medication, um, but is used in many other countries um, regularly, uh, natalizumab or fingolimod. We also have evidence from real world data sets that show us that the use of these newer, more effective therapies as initial treatment, and in this case, it was fingolimod, natalizumab, or alemtuzumab, which is the orange line, that those therapies also reduce the risk of conversion to secondary progressive MS by almost 50% at five years and nine years. And given that we know that this progressive MS means that neurologic reserve has already failed and it's a stage where MS therapies generally don't work, knowing that these higher efficacy medications can delay the onset of progressive disease is a very compelling reason um, to use them early. So while the preceding slides have shown the advantages of preventing you know, early relapses, preventing disability progression by starting these higher efficacy therapies from the get-go, why isn't everyone an inductionist and in using these therapies straight away? Like, what's the catch? Well, this illustration shows that in general, the higher the efficacy of the therapy, the higher the potential risk or burden of treatment, albeit these side effects are generally rare. So what are some of those risks? Well, given that all MS therapies in some way modulate the immune system, infection risk you know, is a key consideration in MS uh, therapies. And in this study, again, using that cohort of uh, Swedish patients and the Swedish National MS Registry, the researchers were looking at the risk of serious infection. So serious infection is defined as those infections that require the patient to go to hospital. Now, that sounds pretty serious. Um, that's why we're defining them as serious infections because um, you got to go to hospital. But most of them are you're going to hospital to get IV antibiotics. In any event, this is looking at over 6,000 people over six years. And compared to the general population, you can see that the rate of infections is higher for all of these different MS-related um, disease-modifying therapies. So this isn't unexpected, though. But the real question is, do we see higher rates of infection when we're comparing our lower efficacy therapies, which are the interferons and the clotiramir acetate, to our higher efficacy therapies? And as it turns out, of the ones that are listed on this table, the only one that shows a statistically significant difference is with rituximab. But my question remains, even if there is a slightly increased risk on these stronger therapies, do the benefits of preventing disability outweigh these risks? And I'd argue that in most cases, they probably do. Now, patients and healthcare providers' biggest worry um, when they're thinking about new MS medications is often the risk of a specific infection caused by the John Cunningham virus or the JC virus called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy or PML. 
And so while some of these numbers seem high, particularly for natalizumab, these risks can be significantly mitigated with pre-screening to make sure that you are selecting patients who are at minimal risk and by regularly monitoring them. So for example, you can't get PML if you don't have the JC virus. And so when deciding on whether to start natalizumab or not, and to see if that might be a good choice for your patient, check their JC virus antibody. And if it's negative, they can't get PML. And actually the risk in that case is about one in 10,000, not one in a thousand uh, listed on the chart that's illustrated. Now you might be wondering, well, why is it not, why is it zero and not one in 10,000? Well, the truth is, is that there's about a three to 8% chance per year that people can pick up this JC virus asymptomatically. And that's why we recommend regular monitoring if you're on natalizumab and check that JC virus at least twice a year so that if they do turn positive that you can transition people to another medication or institute some other changes that might be able to decrease that PML risk. Likewise, for the fumarate medications like dimethyl fumarate, uh, which is mentioned here on the slide, um, as long as you monitor the absolute lymphocyte count and ensure that those levels don't drop below 0.5 for greater than six months, the risk of this infection is negligible. And to put things into context, dimethyl fumarate has been approved for multiple sclerosis for almost 10 years since 2013, and there's only been 11 cases. Now, if you're not using these medications regularly in your practice, knowing what the potential risks are and how to monitor people on these medications can be really daunting. However, you can find this information very quickly just by looking at the first page of the FDA label, which can be easily Googled and is linked off every drug's website. So this is the first page of the FDA label for dimethyl fumarate, and it nicely summarizes the warnings and precautions and how to mitigate them by monitoring for that sustained lymphopenia, which I've outlined in purple. If you actually read through these FDA labels, they also nicely summarize the efficacy data that led to their approval in the first place. So they're a really good resource to look at. So while these two camps may exist, I think the most common approach and the one that I personally use in practice is really an individualized approach that's based on prognostic features, the risks of therapy themselves, and the patient's other medical comorbidities. But I must emphasize that you know, patients and clinicians alike, we do have a tendency to overestimate the risks of side effects and significantly underestimate the risks of undertreating MS, where we know that the risk of disability is exceedingly high. So for that reason, coupled with the evidence that I've already shown you of the advantages of high efficacy therapy early on, I tend to start patients on medium to high efficacy therapies almost exclusively. And only very rarely am I starting low efficacy therapies uh, listed here. So let's apply some of these concepts to a clinical case. So I'd like you to think about this example in terms of what is prognostically unfavorable about this individual's multiple sclerosis course. Then think about what therapy you might consider incorporating their medical comorbidities as well. So this is a 42-year-old black man presents to your office for advice on starting disease-modifying therapy. Now, he was actually diagnosed four years ago after an episode of inflammation in the spinal cord and inflammation in his brainstem causing double vision about nine months after. He recovered really well, though, and said, Doc, I don't want to start disease-modifying therapy. So this is not uncommon. But actually, this, you, know, you really want to counsel patients on the long-term implications of not going on treatment early so we don't get into a position where we find this gentleman. 
So he had another attack of spinal cord inflammation with transverse myelitis seven months later, and this resulted in permanent leg weakness, imbalance. He's got to use a cane for walking now, and he's got significant urinary symptoms. His disability score is a five, meaning that he can only walk 200 meters without using some sort of assistance. His MRI shows that even though he doesn't have you know, a lot of disease in the supratentorial brain, he's still having enhancing lesions, um, even though they're asymptomatic. He's got lesions in the brain stem, which we'd expect based on his double vision. And he's got multiple spinal cord lesions. He's got poorly controlled diabetes and also oral Kirby simplex. So when I'm thinking about this patient, I'm thinking about what are the poor prognostic features? Well, one, he's non-white, he's male, he's older. We've already shown that you know, over the age of 40, um, our disease modifying therapies are less effective. His early clinical course, he's had multiple relapses in the first two years. His interval between attacks is very short, which we've said also has poor long-term prognosis. His recovery of attacks has been incomplete. He has a high EDSS score. We talked in a previous lecture about EDSS scores over 3.5. People are less likely to respond to treatment. And he's got multiple cord lesions. You know, this is an eloquent area where there's less tissue to lose over time. So these are all factors that warrant you know, strong consideration of starting a high efficacy disease modifying therapy right from the very beginning. And I put this very busy slide up here just so you have a reference if you wanna look at some of the potential um, adverse side effects of our medications. But this patient's past medical history also allows us to you know, take some available therapies off the table or at least consider them less. So for example, the S1P inhibitors, medications like fingolimod, are associated with a small risk of macular edema, which is also higher in patients with diabetes, which this man has. Likewise, you know, the S1P inhibitors confer a higher risk of herpes type virus reactivations compared to some of our other drugs. And so given you know, he has diabetes and oral herpes simplex, maybe the S1P inhibitor class isn't the right class for this individual. And again, a quick check of the drug's FDA label can help you identify these potential factors when making your treatment decisions. In this case, if we're looking for a high efficacy therapy and this patient is JC virus negative, I might consider natalizumab or maybe a B cell therapy if um, he does have the JC virus. So this example is just meant to, to show you how we use prognosis and risk factors and comorbidities to try to make a decision, at least narrow the range of the available disease-modifying therapies um, that we would consider um, for a patient. Now, once you've made your initial treatment decision, there's other questions. Now, well, how do you monitor for it to make sure that it's working? And for that matter, what are our goals of therapy anyways? What are the expectations that our drugs can do? So this is where I want you to think about um, the concept of MEDA, or no evidence of disease activity. So what NIDA is, is you know, a striving for disease-free uh, concept in people with MS. And so that includes both clinical features. So we want no relapses, ideally, and no disability progression on their neurologic exam, but also MRI parameters, like no new lesions on their MRI. And ideally, although not often measurable on conventional MRI scanners, slowing down that brain volume loss to within a range of healthy controls. So there's four elements to this uh, NIDA in this example, uh, so we call it NIDA4. NIDA3 would be if we didn't you know, include atrophy. NIDA5 would be if we include something else, for example. Uh, and this is a bit of a moving target, but if NIDA is reached in an individual after two years of treatment with disease-modifying therapy, 
there's almost an 80% chance that their disability would not have progressed seven years later. So even with this lofty goal of NIDA, you know, it actually is only capturing what we can currently see on conventional MRI. And we know that there's disease activity that occurs kind of below the surface uh, that MRI is able to see. You know, it would be great if we had a blood marker in MS that helped us understand if our treatments are working, you know, much like patients with diabetes can be followed with a hemoglobin A1C to monitor their blood sugar control, for example. So there's a lot of ongoing research being done to try to find a better biomarker to capture, you know, all of MS disease activity in a really simple cost-effective way. Even now with advanced MRI, uh, we know that things like cortical lesions, um, brain volume we've talked about, um, normal appearing white matter or normal appearing gray matter isn't really normal. Um, so we got to find better ways to capture this. But with all that being said, you know, well, NIDA might not be achievable in all patients, it's still a good goal to guide therapy and it's a useful concept. Moreover, and in keeping with, you know, the objective of this lecture, we know that the rates of NIDA, so your ability to fully control the disease that, that we can see, is better in newer agents compared to our old injectable agents. So again, these are all phase three clinical trials comparing our newer agents to our older injectable therapies, and all of them do better at um, achieving NIDA um, than the injectable therapies. But achieving NIDA then requires us to be regularly and actively monitoring patients, both clinically and radiographically. So in my practice, I try to see patients at least twice a year and more frequently in the early years both to inquire about potential new symptoms and new relapses, but also to perform a thorough neurologic exam to make sure that there's no subtle disability progression that's going on. These appointments also allow for safety monitoring, um, making sure that patients are adherent uh, to their medications, uh, talking about symptomatic management, uh, screening for other things like depression and cognitive impairment, and talking about managing their other modifiable risk factors. I also do an MRI every year, at least an MRI brain. That's the place where you're most likely to have asymptomatic disease activity, at least for the first five years. Um, and you know, this is the time frame where we're most likely to see breakthrough disease activity from inadequate therapy. And as mentioned, you know, we know that the early disease course influences long-term prognosis. So we want to quickly escalate a patient's therapy if any signs of clinical or radiographic disease are occurring. So if any of those things in the, the NIDA checkbox um, aren't being controlled, that's a reason to escalate therapy. Now, when considering to escalate therapy, I recommend choosing a treatment in a higher efficacy category. So if a patient's on an injectable, you know, go to an oral or an intravenous agent. If a patient's on an oral medication, you know, go to a, a, a high efficacy IV agent rather than switching between the same efficacy categories. Like, remember, we're trying to achieve disease control. We're trying to achieve NIDA as early as possible, particularly within the first two years. So switching within the same efficacy categories is just more likely to delay our therapeutic goal. Now, it's probably self-evident, but there's been numerous studies listed here uh, that show that you know, people whose MS disease is inadequately and controlled with our injectable therapies will benefit, will have better disease control by receiving one of our um, higher efficacy therapies. If for whatever reason, it's challenging to start patients in some of these newer high efficacy therapies, or you, you don't have the resources to safely monitor patients, or you just want an opinion on what might be a good next step, an MS center can help. So please do refer um, if you need our help. Lastly, I just want to leave you with these take-home points, and that is that 
every healthcare provider can play a vital role in MS care, whether it's identifying and treating modifiable risk factors, comorbidities, um, finding support uh, for your patients through the National MS Society, um, treating uh, acute relapses with steroids um, as first-line healthcare workers. We also have shown that substantial world-world evidence exists that early highly effective treatment strategy has better long, better at least medium to long-term outcomes. But we still need to think about balancing that with individual risk and comorbidities. And in order to tell that our medications are working is we do need to regularly monitor patients so that we can quick, quickly escalate their therapy if they've got evidence of ongoing clinical or radiographic disease. And please do refer to an MS center earlier rather than later um, if you need help getting patients um, on highly effective therapy. So that concludes our fourth lecture on MS. I hope you'll join us next time we'll, where we'll be exploring cutting edge research on novel MS therapies. These are the references. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>